Amen. Happy Easter, my friends. Why don't you stand? Let's celebrate together.
never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But no, I never walk away from the one who saved my life. I know I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? why we're here today. We're just here to celebrate Jesus, that he has risen. We have life because of his life. Hey, sing this with me. And I was buried beneath my shame. And who can carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I made you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my truth Till I made you you call my name
let's sing this together. If you know it, you know it. Sing it with me. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Easter to you. It is so wonderful to be here with you. If you're watching online, we're happy to have you here with us as well. Uh, I have a couple just quick little housekeeping things. Uh, if you are new to Gateway, first of all, a warm welcome to you, and we're so grateful that you chose to spend your Sunday morning here with us. We're going to worship a little bit more, and then uh, we're going to take a little break. And during that break, you're welcome to grab some coffee from the back. And if you have elementary age kids, they can go to Kids Church, which is just out the lobby, up the stairs, and to the right. Uh, we have a great crew of people there that will make their Sunday special. And then also, if you have newborns through preschoolers, they're welcome to go to the Children's Center, which is just straight out into the lobby. And you'll see the big sign there that says Children's Center. Again, we're so grateful that you all are here. And I thanked them last service, so I have to do it again, <laughs> of course. But uh, just so grateful for the worship team and all the work that they've put in. Uh, and grateful for all of you that are here. Uh, that's all that I have. Gary's going to pray for our offering, and then, like I said, we're going to worship a little bit more, and we'll have that break. Thanks, Ari. Good morning, everyone. This is the time in our service where we give our offerings. Uh, we don't uh, pass around a plate. There is options to be able to give online that you can see on the back of your bulletin. Uh, there's drop boxes in the back at each exits. And uh, let me just say, if you are visiting with us this morning, uh, we do not uh, want you to feel like you need to give. Uh, we just, we want you to feel welcome. We want you to under no way feel obligated to give. This is a time for, for those of us who have called Gateway uh, our home to be able to give back to the Lord. So let me pray for us and then we'll continue uh, worshiping the Lord in song. Father, you are so good to us. It is so evident. We see it everywhere. We experience it. Even when we don't, though, when we don't see it or experience it, we, we still believe, we still trust. Help us to trust your goodness in every way. Everything that is good that we have, it, it comes from you. And so our, our offering to you this morning is an overflow of your goodness to us. And we want that goodness to be extended to others in this community, uh, in this church, in the lives of the people who need to see more of who you are and more of your goodness. So we pray that you take these offerings and you use it for that purpose and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey, well, uh, kids are dismissed. Uh, say hello to one another. There's truckloads of coffee in the lobby. Uh, and we'll be back in a few minutes.
Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to have you here. He is risen. Indeed. Our text this morning is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. I'm going to read for us, beginning in verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they're going toward the tomb. And both of them are running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in also, and he saw and he believed. For as of yet they did not understand the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then he had said these things to her. Father God, we thank you for this day that we set aside to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the day that literally changed everything for us and for the world. And we thank you for this witness, this account that was written down for us. And and I pray for us as we look at it today, as we ponder it, consider it, that your Holy Spirit will imbue your text with power, with understanding, and with faith for our hearts. And so we give this time to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to have you here today. Yeah, it's a beautiful day out there. And I was actually thinking, um, back in 2010, uh, I started going down to Nicaragua on pretty much a uh, yearly basis. And I don't, I, I can't, so the first couple of years, and maybe you've done this, it was something that you go back and back and back to. I think the first year I went, I took 20,000 pictures. And, you know, then like on the 10th trip, I took like 10 pictures, something like that. But I, I took a lot of pictures of those early years. And sometimes I'll go back and look at those pictures and, and kind of remember stuff. Even sometimes I'll go back and look at pictures and remember stuff that I, like when I look at it later, I realize something was going on there that I didn't see at the time. And, and there's one picture that I have in my mind. So I don't know if it was, it was probably 2013 or 2014. We were down there, and uh, I remember being around some, there were some children there, and there was uh, a girl, and she was wearing a great big t-shirt. It was, it was too big for her, and it was an NFL t-shirt. Now, it, it's not unusual because a lot of North Americans, like, just send clothing down there. So you see a lot of people wearing North American clothing. In fact, a lot of times when we go down there, um, we'll just leave everything in our suitcase that we don't need to get home. And then you'll come back a year or two later and I'll see somebody wearing my tennis shoes or you know, something like that. So it's not unusual to see North American clothing, but I saw this NFL, it was a Super Bowl t-shirt. And when I looked at it, what I thought it said was, I thought it said uh, New England Patriots uh, 2012 Super Bowl champions. So when I looked at it, it caught my attention. I'm not really into football a lot, uh, but I do watch the Super Bowl. Well, I mean, I watch the, the commercials, and I get some of the game in, and I remember being confused because I saw, yeah, I saw that game. 
And as I remember it, the Patriots lost that game to the New York Giants. There were just some things about it that I paid attention to, and I thought, that's weird, that doesn't seem right. But I just kind of moved on, I didn't think about it until years later. So years later, I'm reading this article in Fast Company Magazine, and I just want to read a, a, a piece of it for you. It says, for the Super Bowl, the NFL has to prepare for both teams and their fans, and the immediate rush to buy gear commemorating their team's big win. So pre-made hats, t-shirts, hoodies, and, and more for both teams are on hand at the stadium and shipped ahead to select retailers before each game. Now when the clock hits zero and the champion is crowned, that team's merchandise hits the field and the shelves. So one of the things the NFL does is they produce 100,000 t-shirts for each team, proclaiming them the Super Bowl winner. 100,000. Now the problem was they never knew what to do with those shirts and because they didn't want them out there, the loser shirts, feeling that uh, it would be mocking the losing team, they would just destroy them. They would have them destroyed and put them in a landfill. Until 1997. In 1997, World Vision approached them and said, hey, we've got a better idea. What if we take all the merchandise for the losing team and we take it to a third world country and we let kids, you know, have the clothing that need clothing? The article goes on. Rather than sending it to a landfill, they said, why not ship the losing team's gear to people in countries and communities where the need for clothing is far greater than the need to celebrate a win. Now in past years, it's gone to El Salvador, Haiti, Zambia, Romania, and Nicaragua. And there when I read that, I was like, oh, see, that's it. Now it's a covert operation, and the destination of the swag is kept secret in advance. People don't know where it's going for all sorts of reasons. But, of course, I looked back and thought, so I did see that. That was what, but here's, here's one of the things I immediately thought about. I was like, but that shirt is sending a false message. In fact, 100,000 shirts are basically telling a lie, right? Now the people wearing the shirts probably don't know it. They probably don't. I doubt that little girl follows NFL football. Um, and they don't know, right? So they'll see the shirt and think, oh, well, the Patriots are winners. Yeah, they're, no, they're not. And that, you know, they, and not only that, it's personal, but they're kind of spreading a lie as well and other people will see it. And, and, but now, thankfully, we can, right, we can go back and look at the records. We can go on YouTube and look at who won the game and as there's witnesses to the actual game. But the shirts misrepresent truth. But on the other hand, you know, it's just football. It's just football. It's not like it's something important. And, but, but the reality is our world is filled. It's filled with false messages. It's filled, if you will, with people walking around wearing t-shirts, right, that are proclaiming messages that are false. And we hear them and we see them so much in our culture that we, we oftentimes we don't even notice it anymore. Messages in our culture that say things like, there's no objective truth. I was actually reading an article yesterday where a guy was arguing that two plus two is five. It's just like, right, this is what our culture has come to. You know, there's my truth and there's your truth and, you know, like that whole thing that's going on. Our culture that says, you know, there's no creator. Like I hear that all day long in so many ways. There's no creator. There's no one who designed this. No one designed you. You're just this random chance of, of particles and, and atoms and electricity and chemicals running through your body. And you're just this weird accident. And when life is over, when your life is over, your life is over. That's kind of the whole philosophy of materialism. That we are just made up of matter. That you have no soul. That you have no spirit. And that when your brain stops working, that's just the end of it for you. Or people, on the other hand, will say, oh, you're a god, and, and I'm a god, and goddesses, and we're all gods. And, or if there is a god, you can't really know him. You, you have to try to appease him through rid, religion, and, and whichever one you want to pick, and rules, and rituals. And you know, as long as you're sincere, you'll probably get in, but there's really no way of knowing in this life. So opposed to all that, here at Gateway for the last 14 months, we've been studying the gospel of John. We're calling the series Light. John is an eyewitness. The book of John is a historical eyewitness account. So I say that because a lot of times people say like, well, the book of John is a spiritual book and they'll just automatically cast it aside and say that we, it's not really reliable. But John is essentially an account an eyewitness, somebody who saw something. I don't know if you're like me. I, lo I love to read biographies. And right now I'm, you know, 
uh, reading stuff on Alexander the Great, and it's all really interesting stuff, reading sources and all that, and that's basically what we're saying we have here is a historical account of an event that actually happened. Now, of course, it's more than that, because we believe that God is involved in the writing of this, but this is written by a guy named John who was an eyewitness to historical events. And what John will say to us as we go through the gospel from the very beginning is, first thing, number one, you need to know in the beginning there was God. There's a God before you and a God before me. We are not the center of history and the world and all that's important. We have a creator, someone who created us with design, someone who created us for purposes. Jesus put it this way, so love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But we sinned. We didn't do those things. And, right, so Jesus came to us. He came to us as God in flesh. He came as one of us. He came to rescue us from sin and death. We were never going to look for him. We were never going to seek him. So he came to us. He lived among us. He, he taught truth. He worked miracles to substantiate the amazing claims that he made that the people stumbled over all the time. And yet, it says many people preferred darkness over light. Again, none of this stuff should be astounding to us. We live in a world right now where we read, a lot of times on social media, people all day long who choose darkness, who choose ignorance, who choose lies over what is true. Right, we scratch our heads. How do we explain that? Right, I have conversations with people all the time. How do you explain that? How does somebody do that? It's called sin. It's called darkness. But the story talks about Jesus who was betrayed, who is guiltless and yet condemned by Pilate to death, which I think primarily for Pilate was a, was a political solution to a problem, politics. You know. He was beaten. He was crucified. Again, we, we read about crucifixion and we just think it's this kind of otherworldly thing, but back then, crucifixion and that day was something that you saw on a regular basis. You, you walked down the road and saw people who were being crucified. There's a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. He was a secret disciple of Jesus. He and a guy named Nicodemus got permission to place Jesus' body in a tomb and the entrance was sealed. His followers watched him die. And they expected him to stay dead. See, that's the one thing you see when you go through the accounts of the resurrection is no, nobody was like, aha, I knew it. Right? Nobody's doing that. Nobody expects him to rise from the dead. They're devastated. They're afraid. They go to their homes and they lock the doors. And John's account moves quickly from the death of Christ and the darkness over the land to the sunrise on Sunday as if almost nothing really significant happened. In between, the world was just waiting for Christ to rise from the dead. They expected him to stay dead. They were devastated and afraid. And yet, we find in this story this morning that we read an unexpected discovery. It's not what they were looking for. In John chapter 20, verse 1, again, it says, Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the empty tomb while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So we're told it's the first day of the week. It's Sunday. It's still dark, which is, by the way, why we worship on Sunday. People say, why do Christians get together in church on Sunday? Because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead, and we just can't help ourselves. It's the Lord's day. So Mary Magdalene uh, gets there, and she's there because she thinks that Jesus is dead and in the tomb, and the body hasn't properly been prepared for burial. That's why she comes. That's why she brings supplies. Now, she's not alone. In verse 2, she talks about, you know, we plural, but she, John doesn't say who she was with. The other Gospels tell us that Mary, Jesus' mother, was there. Salome was there. Joanna was there. There may have been others there. And when they get there, they discover something they were not expecting. I know we read the story today, and we're like, well, duh, how could they miss that? But they're, they're not expecting this. The stone covering the tomb entrance has been moved. It would have been heavy and difficult to move. In fact, they were having a discussion on their way there who's going to move the stone because they believe that the stone's still there and the body's still inside. So they know that someone has either gone into the tomb or someone's gone out of the tomb or both. Now Mary, maybe Mary looks inside or maybe she just assumes there's no body. But in verse 2 it says, she ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So 
she says they've taken the Lord. Who is they? Who does she think has taken the body? Now, there's several theories. One is grave robbers. We know that grave robbing was something that happened back then. We know that this was considered the tomb of a rich man, even though Jesus wasn't rich in the worldly sense. And so it may have been that they thought this is a new tomb and there's got to be some stuff in there, some, some treasure and some money. So maybe it was grave robbers. Maybe it was the Jewish leaders. That's another theory. They were afraid that the disciples might take and hide the body and say, Jesus rose from the dead. And so they decided to take the body first. Of course, the problem is if Jesus really did raise from the dead and the disciples are out telling everyone he rose from the dead, they could have just produced the body, but they never did. But notice what Mary doesn't say. Mary doesn't say, hey, I was just at the tomb, and guess what? Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah, he's risen, right? There's none of that. No one's expecting that. So she doesn't know what happened, but the one thing she doesn't think that happened was Jesus actually rose from the dead. Verse three, so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. And both of them were running together. I just love this passage. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Can't read that without laughing. So here's why. So the other disciple here is the anonymous disciple. And we know that this is John. Now John is the one who wrote this gospel. But John never refers to himself by his name. He always refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, or he's just the other disciple. So John lets us know that it's him without letting us know it's him. But he also lets us know that he outran Peter to the tomb. And I just love that little fact. He's like, yeah, I don't know that John's like, hey, you know, 2,000 years later, people on this side of the world are me talking, and I want them to remember that I got there first, right? Like, I don't know. Now, it's interesting because we believe that John was probably the youngest and Peter was the oldest. So I can imagine Peter hoofing it there. I, I can relate to that. I, I, John's gospel records four stories in which John and Peter seem to be a little competitive with each other. I don't know. But this is, I just love this little John's like, just for posterity's sake, you know, I got there first. And he gets there. Now, most uh, ancient tombs were kind of carved into rock, carved on the side of a hill. And usually you went down a couple steps and the entrance was really low. So he gets there and he stoops down and he's looking into the chamber. John, John gets there first, but he doesn't go in right? He stoops down, he looks in, but you know, it's a tomb, so he's not going in there. He's the younger guy. Verse 6, then Simon Peter came. I just always picture Peter like, <sighs> and Peter follows him, and Peter went in, just, he doesn't even slow down. Peter, it's Peter, right? He just goes right into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. So we know that for the most part, Egyptians embalmed their dead. And we know that Romans and Greeks often cremated their dead. But the Palestinian Jews would wrap their dead in linen cloth, a shroud. And they would wrap it up and they would place it in a tomb and the person would lay on their back. No coffin is involved. The arms would be folded and they'd use maybe upwards of 100 pounds of spices and perfumes. A lot of times these tombs were near places where people lived and so this is to help deal with the smell. And John mentions two items in particular. He mentions the linen cloth. Now, again, a Jewish corpse would be wrapped tightly with these shrouds of cloth uh, from head to toe and covered with 100 pounds or more of spices. But he also mentions the face cloth. Uh, actually, um, in the Latin, we get the word napkin for this Greek word, and it's the idea of this kind of napkin-shaped piece of cloth that wraps around the head and under the jaw, and it keeps the mouth closed. And so he, he mentions this piece as well. And jo what John notes is that they're kind of different. So it's a little hard to break this down in the Greek, but it, it, it appears that what he's saying is that the linen cloth were lying there as if Jesus' body just passed right through it. And so the linen's there and it just kind of maybe slumps down a little bit, but it's just right there where he was. But the face cloth has been neatly folded up and placed over to the side. Now compare that with Lazarus when he was raised from the dead. Remember, he's fully covered in everything and people got to come and unwrap him. But Jesus is all unwrapped here. And they, so they look in and they see that the cloth is all there, but Jesus isn't there, which would be a weird thing. Like, how would that happen? Takes us to our next point, a life-altering truth. In verse eight, we continue. It says, now the other disciple, that's John, who had reached the tomb first, just so we don't forget that, also went in, 
and he saw and he believed. For as of yet, they did not understand the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. So it says this. It says that two words that are important. John saw. Now the word for saw is not the typical word we would use in the Greek for saw. Horao is the word which means not merely to see something, but to see and discern. To see something and know what it is. To know what it represents. So John sees this situation and he, he comprehends, he grasps. Now what is it that he believed? That's the second word. He said he saw it and he believed. What does he believe? Well, he already believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. The context suggests that what he believes now is the resurrection. Because none of them had expected a resurrection. And the verb believed here stresses the beginning of an action and its continued state. So something happens. John sees this and he begins to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. Which, by the way, makes John the first person in the world to believe that Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He's the first and here's something else that's different about John. While the rest of the disciples will believe in Jesus' resurrection after they see the resurrected Jesus, John is the only one who believes in the resurrected Jesus before he sees the resurrected Jesus, which, by the way, makes him a lot like you and me, right? Because we have believed before we have seen. We have evidence. We have faith. We have the Word of God. But we have not seen the Lord Jesus Christ yet, and in that sense, a little, a little like John. Peter, on the other hand, apparently, does not see and believe. Luke describes him this way. It says, Peter saw the linen cloth by themselves, and he went home marveling. Now, the word marveling in the Greek it means to admire. It means to wonder, but it does not mean to believe. So, as of yet, they did not understand. Now, Jesus had spoken of, of his crucifixion and resurrection, he had told them about it, but they didn't grasp it. And I think that the problem was, and this is just my theory, that the, the resurrection was just a secondary issue. What they could never really comprehend was the crucifixion. They always pushed back on the crucifixion. If you don't believe in a crucifixion, then what point is a resurrection? But they don't believe it, but now they can see it with their own eyes. They can look and see that Jesus is not in the tomb. But they needed the scriptures to explain to them what it was that they were seeing the vital information they needed. See, the scriptures reveal all sorts of stuff. It reveals the necessity of, of a resurrection and of a crucifixion. It reveals the prophecies that were given years and years in advance about this event. It reveals that it was actually ordained by God. The crucifixion and resurrection was not some situation that God didn't foresee and then he figured out a way to redeem the thing. It was always his plan. He was always in control. But they didn't grasp that. And that this was God's provision for their salvation. They never put that together. This, by the way, is why we teach the Bible here. Experience is absolutely a part of faith. True faith is something we experience. But it's also more than that. It's the Bible that defines and informs what it is that we believe. We need the word of God to explain to us the things of God. Going on in verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. So notice what they don't do again. They don't run into town and start proclaiming a resurrection and you know, yelling at everybody, Jesus is risen from the dead, and start baptizing people and have a church membership class and start building a church. They don't do any of that stuff. Instead, because they don't understand, they go home, they have microwave dinner, watch a little Netflix, and go to bed wondering. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what that was. <laughs> they just, yeah, I don't know. Nobody's in the tomb. That's weird. For this reason, Jesus will be the one to pursue them. I mean, the whole gospel starts with Jesus pursuing them. They didn't pursue him. They weren't chasing after him, and neither do we. We, we don't know the Lord, for those of us who know the Lord, we don't know him because one day we just got smart enough to figure it out and pursue him. He will pursue them. He will pursue them. He will come and find them in the places they're hiding and he will reveal himself to them just as he revealed himself to the world. And that's what Jesus does. He seeks and he saves. And still today, it's the only way that we'll find him. It's because he finds us. But Mary stays at the tomb. Unlike Peter, Unlike John, she stays there, she's weeping, 
And it says she wept. Same word in the Greek. It means to wail and sob out loud. People could hear her down the block. She is heartbroken. This is a woman who Jesus casted demons out of her. Her life was radically changed in that moment. She has a profound gratitude and love for the Lord. She's heartbroken. She will not leave that place. I was reading someone this week who said, it's amazing how some people feel very little gratitude for what Jesus has done for them. They pray with very little gratitude. They sing without much joy. They wake up in the morning and live their day without thanking the Lord. They eat their meals. They swim in the blessings of God. And they're not very thankful for what they've experienced. But here's Mary. She is at the tomb. She's not leaving because that is her life. That is everything. If Jesus is truly dead, she is as well. That's it for her. He was her hope. Verse 12. And she saw two angels. She looks in the tomb and she sees two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and and one at the feet. So there's two angels that evidently look like men. She doesn't know they're angels. Now, first century tombs often had a bench that was cut into the back part of it. It was carved out. It's where the body would be laid. And the angels are sitting where the body had been. It says one at the head and, and one at the feet. And it's interesting, again, we... We've mentioned this over the last few weeks. It's like John goes through details, boom, 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 and then he'll stop and give you a whole bunch of stuff and you wonder why. What's, like, what's up with that? And that's what he does here. He gives us a whole bunch of detail about this. And the question becomes, why does John focus on this particular thing, this particular detail? The position of the angels. And scholars believe that what's happening here is John is signaling us. He's signaling us and he, and he thinks that hopefully we'll think of the mercy seat of God and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, most people, when they think of the Ark of the Covenant, you know, they think of this. This is like all they know, right? Which is, by the way, a pretty good movie. But um, this is actually the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And it's a, it's a fairly okay reproduction of it. And on the top, there are these angels, these cherubim that are facing each other. This is what we believe is being signaled here. Now, inside the box is a, a jar of manna and Aaron's rod that budded and, and the tablets on which God gave the law. And on the top is a mercy seat or, or more technically a bench. And there are these angels on both sides. Right? They're kind of covering the whole thing. And they're cherubim is what they are. In, in Exodus 25 are the instructions for making this. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work you shall make them on the two ends of, of the mercy seat. So the mercy seat represents God's throne on earth, the the bench that's on top. And his presence resided there. And on the Day of Atonement, when sacrifice was made for the people, um, animals were sacrificed and the blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. And on that mercy seat, it represented God's mercy to people for the forgiveness of their sin. And so in this mercy seat, on the top are these angels. So when Mary sees this, it's like signaling something, right? There's, there's nothing in between the angels, just the shroud that's there. And the picture is this, that the ultimate sacrifice for our sin has now been made. Jesus has atoned for our sins with his blood and no more sacrifices are needed. He's gone. He's risen from the dead. Verse 13, and they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. See, Mary doesn't understand what she's looking at. She came to the tomb because she saw Jesus die and she expected him to be dead. She came to finish preparing his body for burial. But, but the body's not there, so they ask her a question. Why are you weeping? It might seem obvious and it might seem insensitive, but actually I think they're trying to just provoke her thinking here with a question. Because the reality is that her her tears are needless and her anxiety is unnecessary in that moment. And it made me think, like, how often are we anxious about things for which there's no cause for anxiety? Because God is at work. Because God is sovereign. Because God is doing something amazing. And what what should cause us? How often is we, have we been standing in a situation where we should be filled with joy and instead we're, we're crying, we're upset. This is what's happening, but they're going to help her. In verse 14, and having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing, but she, did not, she didn't know that it was Jesus. So Jesus, I don't, I don't know if he sneaks up on her. Or, you know, if, if he just appears, 
It doesn't really say. Uh, Chrysostom, who was a believer back in the 300s, has a theory that's pretty good. His whole theory is this, that that you've got the angels down in the tomb and they're talking to Mary who's at the entrance and, and Jesus appears in back of her. And when Jesus appears, the angels, seeing God in the flesh, their eyes get big and there's probably a look of awe on their face and she's like, what's going on? And it kind of signals she turns around. My theory is just they, they point. You know, like, <laughs> it's like it's, it, turn around, right? You need to turn around and see Jesus. And she turns around, but she doesn't recognize that it's Jesus. And again, there's all sorts of theories. Why doesn't she know it? Uh, one theory is that she's been crying so much. Have you ever done that? That you just can't see straight at that moment? So she can't really see him or the light was too dim uh, or her eyes are just supernaturally kept from recognizing Jesus. A theory that, that holds a lot of water because we know that's gonna be the case uh, very soon again with some guys walking down the Emmaus Road. And then Jesus talks to her. He says to her, woman, which is, by the way, a term of respect. He says, why are you weeping. Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, which I love, she said to him, sir, if if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I I will take him away. So she asked, he asked the same question that the angels asked and then he gives a follow-up question. He says, whom are you seeking? Which by, uh, in the Greek, it's word for word exactly what Jesus said in chapter 18 when people came to arrest him and he said, whom do you seek? And she thinks he's the gardener, which I I love. Like he just happens to be out there trimming the hedges and mowing the lawn in the morning, you know. But again, there's kind of some signaling going on, right? We're we're, we're hearkening back. How does the book of John begin? In the beginning. John is always making us think of Genesis. He's making us think maybe here, remember Genesis, remember God creating Adam and Eve and putting them in a garden and giving them life and then they sinned and now we have another garden. We have a new garden. We have a new gardener who's come to make everything right, to make everything new, to make it so we can be right with God. And now Mary is seen an empty tomb and she's seen angels and she's seen Jesus but she thinks they're all just people who just happen to be there. In fact, she thinks maybe the gardener took the body away for whatever reason. To Mary, the empty tomb is just this cause of grief when in fact the exact opposite is true. The empty tomb declares the victory of Jesus over sin and over death. Jesus overturns grief with grace. And this is still true today. We we have this hope beyond the grave. This life is not all that there is. We have a risen Savior. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus appears to Mary first. Let's talk about this for a minute. He appears to Mary first. He doesn't appear to an apostle first. He doesn't appear to a prophet first. He doesn't appear to the high priest or to some politically connected person. And it's significant that he appears to a woman first because women in that culture were so marginalized that they were not allowed to be eyewitnesses in court. So if a woman had seen, maybe she saw something, uh, uh, maybe she, she saw a crime, she couldn't go to court and testify because she was a woman. And women couldn't be trusted to, to testify, to get all the facts right. But I love the fact that God says, well, the first, the first person who sees this is gonna be a woman. I'm going to send a woman to go to the disciples. In fact, what we could really say here is that she becomes an apostle to the apostles. Apostle simply means sent one. And so the Lord sends her to the rest of the apostles. Mary has this remarkable role. She has demons cast out of her by Jesus. She witnesses his death. She's the first to discover the empty tomb. She's the first to see and to talk with the resurrected Jesus. And he gives her a message. He gives her a ministry, a message to deliver. In verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. So again, there's so much here, but so little time. Jesus talks about my brothers. That that term in the Greek is inclusive of both men and women. He could, he's literally saying brothers and sisters. And this is the, the first time in this gospel that that term brothers has been used to describe the disciples. It signals a new kind of relationship with Jesus, that he is both our savior 
and, and God, but he's also our brother. That is, he, he was a human. He lived with us. He knows our experience. He knows what it's like to be us. He was one of us, and yet at the same time, Scripture says, he's the unique son of God. He's the second member of the Trinity. But he's now our brother as well. And he invites us into his family. In John 1, 12, he says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, notice, children of God. So there's a big debate going on here about what's the whole deal with Jesus saying, you know, don't cling on to me. And I think it's actually helpful to think about that for a minute. Why does Jesus say that she needs to let go? The inference is she's grabbing onto his ankles or whatever, and she's excited, she's worshiping him. Uh, One theory is just that Jesus wants Mary to realize a new relationship is being established. She she refers to him as her rabbi, but what he's saying is, I'm more than your teacher now. I am your savior. I am your Lord. I am your God. And so he's letting her know there's a new kind of relationship that's established here. Certainly that's part of what's happening. Another theory is that he's challenging Mary to change her thinking about his physical presence. Up to now, they only, they've only known Jesus in a physical body. But in 40 days, he's going to ascend to the Father. And he will no longer be here physically as, as he was then. And, and then he would send the Holy Spirit who would dwell in us, the presence of Christ in us, which he says is a better thing because while he was on the earth, he could only be in one place at a time. Now he'll be able to reside in every believer all over the world at the same time. And so by you know, saying let go, he's trying to help her understand that some distance is beginning to happen between us and the body of Christ. But there's a third theory, and this is the one that I kind of grab onto the most, and that is simply that Mary needs to let go so she can go. In other words, let me paraphrase what Jesus is saying. You need to let go of me because you need to take my message to the disciples. Tell them that I am risen from the dead and I am in the process of ascending. I say process because really, technically, his ascension begins when he rises from the dead. And it's completed when he ascends to heaven. He says, you need to go tell people that I have risen from the dead, that I am ascending, and you have to go. You have to go and share this with other people. In other words, Mary has a a message to deliver. She has to go tell the disciples what she has seen and what she has heard. What has she seen and heard? She's seen an empty tomb. She's talked to some angels. She's talking to the risen Jesus. And now she has become an apostle or an ascent one to the apostles. She can't fulfill her mission if she, I mean, you can imagine, couldn't you? That she's there and she's holding on to Jesus and she's probably thinking, I'm never letting go. I'm never, ever letting go. I'm just going to be here. Why would you leave? But Jesus says, you have to go. You have to let go of me and you have to take a message to the apostles. Which is, by the way, what we do today. I mean, we gather in here. We worship the Lord. We fellowship together, right? It's great to be here, but we don't stay here because we have a message, and that message needs to go out. God has given us a a commission. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. And so we go, and we tell people about the risen Lord. In verse 18, Mary Magdalene went. So she let go, and she went, and she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. And this starts a chain reaction that grows and grows and grows. Jesus appears to Mary. Then Jesus appears to several women returning from the tomb. Then he appears to Peter. Then he appears to two disciples walking down the road to Emmaus. Then he appears to the ten apostles without Thomas and then with Thomas. And then he appears to seven disciples who were fishing at the Sea of Tiberias, and then he appears to 11 apostles in Galilee, and then he he appears to about 500 people at one time, and then to James only, and then to the group, however many were there, when he ascends to heaven. And and then the the Holy Spirit comes, and and he indwells believers, and thousands of people believe on that day. And then they begin to go out and tell people in Jerusalem about the risen Lord, and then they go to Judea and tell about the risen Lord, and then they go out to more towns and and to countries, to nations, to to continents, and it goes from, from one decade to the next, to the next, to the next, all the way down to those of us in this room today. This witness, this testimony, because Jesus is risen from the dead, 
Because Jesus is alive, because his tomb is still empty. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. In John 21, 24, I love how John kind of wraps up the book. He says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. Yeah, I know in this life you're going to read all sorts of messages, false messages, t-shirts that tell you all sorts of lies and all that stuff. I want to tell you what the truth is. I want to tell you what I have seen and what I have heard. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He, was, he died for our sins. He rose for our sins. He ascended to heaven. I'm bearing witness about these things. He's who has written these things and we know that his testimony, he says, is true. A little earlier in John 20, he puts it this way. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not all written in this book. Like he says, if I wrote down everything, this would be a really, really long book. But these are written so that you may, that you may, what? Believe. That's why. Not just that you may know, not just you may study it, not just that you'll hear sermons on it, but that you'll believe that you will believe, what? That Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is God, and that by believing, you may have, here's the key, you may have life, life, life now and life eternal. And that is what God offers to us. That is why he seeks us. That is why he relentlessly comes after us. And if he did not come after us, we would never find him. You know, whenever I think about salvation and how amazing it is, I always just think of my own story. I grew up in Orange County, California. I've shared this with you before, but when I I was 15 years old, I had never heard the gospel. I still think back, I can't believe that I had never heard the gospel. Jesus was just this religious guy, but I didn't know about the cross. I didn't know about his offer of salvation. And I just lived in this culture of false messages, and I just believed them because they were told to me. I was told there's no creator. There's no God. I was told this is all biological. You have no soul. And when life is over and the electricity stops flowing through, you're just done. That's it. I was told we have no soul. That we're just meat and bones, you know. Or some, some people would say, I lived in a very Catholic town, they would say, you know, if there is a God, you can't really know him. I mean, you really can't know God. Just try to be good and do some rituals and try to be, maybe God grades on a curve, we don't know, but if he does, just try to be better than half the people you know, maybe you'll, you know, you'll make it in, but you can't really know that. And then one day, there was a guy who was a Christian who was trying to witness to my dad, and he gave my dad a book. It was, it was a book full of terrible theology and terrible like end time stuff, like almost none of it was true. But in the middle of this book full of gibberish, he he presented the gospel. Hal Lindsey just very clearly presented the gospel and he shared John three sixteen: For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I'd never read the Bible. I didn't know any scripture and then I read that verse. I don't know how to explain it. I read that verse having no background, never been in church, never read the Bible. I read that verse. I read his explanation of the gospel and something in me said, that is it. But it wasn't me. I didn't figure that out. God brought his word alive. The gospel is alive and living and active. And God did a work in me. The Bible is a a witness, a supernatural witness. We say, we use the word inspired. It is God infused. That is how one day I knew nothing about the gospel and the next morning I woke up knowing that I had a relationship with the living God. 2,000 years later, Jesus is alive. Jesus is still saving those who trust in him. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, is, I just, I'm like a, a record on repeat here. When we come to Easter, I always use this verse. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's the key. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. With the heart, when we believe we are justified, that is, we are made right with God based on the work of Christ. With the mouth, one confesses and is saved. It simply means this. When we believe in the message of the gospel, when we try, we don't have it all figured out. We don't have all the theology worked out yet. 
Doesn't mean that we know how to vote, you know, for the election or, you know, whatever it is that you're struggling with. I don't know, that kind of stuff. It just means this. You know in your heart that Jesus Christ is God, that he died for your sin and he rose from the dead. All the rest of the stuff, God will teach you. You'll learn as you go on, but you believe in Christ. And when you do that, you will confess with your mouth. You will. You can't help it. You will do it because it comes from your heart. The mouth always confesses what's in the heart. That's it. That's all I got. I want to pray for us and I want to give you an invitation. If you came here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Christ, right, here's how you do it. You don't have to walk the aisle. You don't have to become a member. You don't have to fill out a slip of paper. You just have to believe in your heart. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. I want to encourage you today, if you came and you've never believed in Christ, you can do that right now. He is seeking you. He is pursuing you. He loves you. And he wants to save you and forgive you of your sin. We're going to have some people up here during the closing song. If you'd like to come up, if you'd like to maybe talk with someone, pray with someone about giving your life to Christ, or maybe you're a believer, but today you'd love to come and have a talk with somebody or pray with somebody about something spiritual, whatever it is in your life. We'll have people up here who would love to do that with you. Let me pray for us and we'll close together with a song. Father God, I thank you so much for just these 18 verses. There's obviously so much more, but this, this witness of someone who saw something, who heard something, and who's passed that down. These words that are alive. Father, I thank you that you ordained that each one of us would be in this room today on purpose, for a reason. Father, my prayer is that every one of us today will be able to be that person who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in our heart that you raised him from the dead, that Jesus is Lord. I thank you that the tomb is empty. I thank you that our Savior is alive. We celebrate that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, let's stand. Let's sing together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he can love me a sinner condemned unclean singing how marvelous how wonderful am I song shall
Summed in glory His face I at last shall see To be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me To sing it how marvelous Just one more time, just our voices today. Let's celebrate this. Singing, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for Praise God. Hey, happy Easter. I'd love to sing with you guys more next week. So come back uh, and we'll see you soon. Happy Easter.